Good evening. It's a great pleasure that uh, Mark Dytham is here tonight. Um, Mark and his partner Astrid um, have been in Japan for over 10 years now. And uh, what's really amazing about their, their work is that they're not a conventional practice in, in, in the sense that we know many offices here in the UK. I think they, they transcend many boundaries. I think what was fantastic for me when I met Mark in, uh, in Tokyo is just to experience the incredible energy and enthusiasm that he possesses personally and I think it's very 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 much evident in the work that uh, the practice produces and it's 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 important that they do sometimes very simple things very well very modest things very well um, but the the work of the practice obviously ranges from temporary structures to offices to housing um, advertising uh, to interiors and I think that aspect of the work and keeping that fresh means that they are really quick in terms of their, their thinking and I think that that's also something that is quite different from cer certain conventions of practice where everything is taking a very very long time. I think in that sense they've adapted to the Japanese situation and have now created their own in a sense version of, uh, of the work which is obviously something that's incredibly attractive to, to the Japanese clients in, in some way. So I'm delighted that, uh, that he's here. I think it's the first time that he's giving a talk in London. And um, I hope that uh, you uh, will enjoy the presentation as uh, much as I think I, I will enjoy it. Please welcome Mark Dyson. Thank you very much, Moisin. Um, it's actually the second time I've spoken in London. Uh, I just spoke a year ago at J2001, but that was more about the architecture of Japan, not specifically our work. I'm going to take my jacket off. Um, <laughs> um, I'd actually call this lecture uh, Ando or Anarchy. Um, and, and, what, and what do I mean by that? Well, Japan is a very different place to the place I arrived in is that right? no. um, 14 years ago. Um, then it was Ando, Takamatsu, Kurokawa, Izazaki, and it was really the height of the bubble, and any folly was possible. Um, today it's a very different place, um, but that's what, if you believe the newspapers and uh, the television. Um, I think Ron was saying a bit earlier, yes, yesterday on CNN again, um, doom and gloom from Japan, and sometimes when I'm in Europe or the US, I'm really scared, it's as if I've got to get back to Japan immediately because it's not going to be there, there's just, so, there's just, just disaster. Um, they've got negative uh, they have negative in, in interest rates, which means you pay the bank to keep the money safe, um, which is kind of strange. Um, you know, it's a recession. They've had the highest, highest unemployment for years and years. Um, there's no um, full-time employment for the, for, for the whole of your life. Uh, it's just like the UK. But um, as I say, <laughs> you, uh, you kind of get scared. Um, so when I get back to Japan, thinking that it's not going to exist, um, what normally happens, or what I normally find, is um, something like this. Um, this is a store opening um, about a year ago. Um, it's for a department store, we did a renewal, and uh, there's 6,000 people waiting to get in. Um, you've been all waiting patiently since uh, early, early morning. Um, the the, the uh, line goes up the pavement, crosses a road, and comes back on the other side. Um, what, the, um, what the news reports fail to add is that personal saving in Japan is still at its highest, around 20%. So everything you earn, goes 20% uh, of that goes into the bank. So the population at large is very solvent. Uh, hence, uh, they have the highest consumption of designer goods anywhere in the world. Um, over 50% of Louis Vuitton's sales are in Japan and hence they have the biggest store in the world. Hence they have the biggest launch party in the world. Um, there's Louis Vuitton by Janalki, which opened about three months ago and I was lucky enough to get to... Uh, this is outside, again, they were queuing up uh, for two days before the store opened. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. Um, 
it was party at at atmosphere, as you can see outside, people queuing there, while uh, the very important people in Japan uh, lined, lined up. We had to wait 20 minutes to get in the store ourselves. Uh, but this is at the after party, uh, sort of very extravagant. They, uh, this was a museum that they projected images of Louis Vuitton, and they're, they're all moving. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely um, astounding. So um, this is where I met Moisen. Um, there he is at the back there. Um, <laughs> lurking in the photograph. <laughs> That's uh, Junko Kashino in the middle. And uh, the sun's here tonight, so I put that in there for you guys. Um, so you can see the power of Louis Vuitton. It brought us together. And uh, I'll come to that a little bit later. Anyway, as you can see, we're a very serious office. Um, we think a lot. And we, don't, we have no fun because it's Japan. Um, so what I thought I'd do um, is talk a little bit about our office and a little bit about our, our earlier projects, and then I'll get on to the new stuff a little bit later. Um, this is where we sort of work. Um, this is called Deluxe. Uh, it's a warehouse. Um, it is about 300 square meter warehouse in the middle of Tokyo. And we've, we managed to pick up this space because of the recession. Um, it allowed us, uh, there are lots of odd bu buildings which are floating around on the market. And that's given um, us, us, us a chance to rent this space. Um, we operate our office behind the wall, behind the wallpapered wall. And this is the main space. It's about 10 meters by 10 meters. And this is where we have meetings and presentations and art events and, in and installations. Um, there's some Japanese artists suspended from the ceiling in a bath, which is full of feathers. She's naked. And she came in at 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening and sat in the bath. There's a, there's a video camera up there which projects her image onto a TV. Uh, down below, and that was it. So, um, but it was very interesting. They would have, typically for an installation in the space, would have an op opening party. That's something. We did have a client, actually a construction company came to Tokyo. You'll see the house we built a little bit later. This guy was his first ever trip to Tokyo. He was, you know, it's, it's two, two and a half, three hours from Tokyo. He'd never been to, to Tokyo before. A very small construction company. And he came to, he, he came into the space. Not only was it a large warehouse, not only was it full of foreigners, there was this woman hanging from the bath, dropping feathers over the top. I cannot, can't quite imagine what he said when he went back to his hometown to say he'd, he'd been to this very strange design office. Um, we have workshops. This is with Tomato when they were over in uh, to to Tokyo last year. Um, we also run an improv music fest festival, um, probably twice a month. Uh, we have all sorts of unusual people pl playing. Now, all of the furniture, as you saw earlier, those, uh, the ailers and the tables, they're just tre trestles. All of those get moved to the edge, and uh, we can have an event. And then we can turn it into a gallery space. Um, within Deluxe, there are five groups of people. There are five members, um, five offices. There's ourselves. There's a company called Namaiki. They're a graphic design company doing work with Sony. They did all the uh, graphics for the Ibo dog. Um, and this is some of their work. They're actually carpets. They're two-inch thick uh, shag pile c carpets with their graphics st stitched on. And this was um, an opening event. We also have a DJ in the space, uh, DJ Quiet Storm, who's quite a well-known guy into Tokyo. Uh, we have an high-end TV computer graphics company. And we're also the home to Tokyo Brewing Company. Um, and that's a, that's a beer company. And we're trying to get a, a micro, mi microbrewery going. We've actually got a microbrewery going in Tokyo. Um, and that beer company, we actually all work, work on, and that's what actually keep, keep, keeps us all together. Um, another event, this is Sajiko M. Um, again, very minimal um, music uh, performance, just r running with sine waves, very, very, very simple, very nice. And a fashion show, one of our friends, fashion designer. Um, so we probably hold about 250 people within the space. We also do things to the outside of the building, so we've, uh, we've painted the, uh, the wallpaper pattern on the outside of the building. And this was an event for the British Council. Um, the jam, I think that was, it was in the Barbican this time last year. Uh, there was a sister exhibition in to Tokyo, and uh, we, we were designing the exhibition. You'll see that a little bit later. And uh, this was the pup party um, in Deluxe that evening. So that gives you some idea of um, the environment that we work in. And it's very much about crossover, and it's very much about excitement of Tokyo. Um, there's a lot of design, fashion designers, there's a lot of good graphics. Um, we're trying to make Deluxe the, the melting pot for that. 
Um, we have very little time to escape from the office, so it's better if we can bring people to our office so, so, so we don't have to run around too much. Um, anyway, this is uh, our first pro project, our first built project in Tokyo uh, in 1996 for a furniture company called E-Day. Um, a little bit similar to Conran, um, sort of design of furn furniture. And this is a showroom and a design office. At the top, there's a, uh, a small design office. Um, it's on a very busy crossing, and the client wanted an all-glass building. And we felt that um, being a furniture store and, no and knowing the client, he would just jam it full with furniture, and it looked absolutely untidy. But also, um, you know, there's this mess outside the building. There's the telegraph poles, the, elect the, the electrical ca cables. So there's this mess outside and a potential mess inside as well. So what we did is put this polycarbonate, twin wall polycarbonate screen on the front of the building, which acts as a veil both ways, a filter. Um, so you actually can't quite see inside. You've got some idea that there is something happening inside. You've got obviously at the ground floor an idea that it is a furniture store. But equally so, when you're inside the building, you can't quite see out. You can't see the mess of uh, the telegraph poles. And then at night, it takes on a different character too. It almost becomes like a Japanese lan lantern. Um, we put colour, the, the polycarbonate screen is detached from the building and on the, the, the vertical glass, uh, which is on, on the inside, we put just coloured film on there. The whole interior of the building is white, this is the west facade, so as the sun sets, you get these big colour casts um, across the uh, white interior. You can see the uh, twi twin wall polycarbonate on the outside of the building. And the idea is that this, these colour films can be changed. Um, this was way before the iMac, this is 1996. Um, most, most people see this and say, oh, you're obviously inspired by the iMac, um, uh, two years uh, prior to that. Um, sorry, this is reading off my iPod and it's taking a bit of time. Um, Within the building, um, we've actually built on an, uh, it was the, the site was for a petrol station, or it was the existing site for a petrol station. And when we came to see the site, there was this existing building, which is on the right-hand side, uh, the yellow block. And normally in Japan, you would knock everything down, you know, and start from a fresh site. We thought it was pretty nice, this little bit building, 1950s co concrete block. So we decided to leave it and build around it. So we've left all of the... Uh, the floors adjacent to it as expanded metal, so you can actually see the volume uh, within the space. So that's what the building used to look like, and that's the actual the whole site. So we've just left that there and built around it. So the building is completely pure, uh, it's a complete open space apart from that block, which became the small off office on the toilet. And this was quite a revelation in Japan to actually do that. The priest who came to bless the site, which he assumed was going to be flat with nothing there, didn't quite know what to do because there's this existing building there. Um, and this really began um, what was called the recycle boom in Japan. Um, they don't renovate buildings in Japan, they recycle them. And uh, this, was one, this has been pick, pick, picked up as one of the first examples of that in Japan. Now for us it was a completely normal thing to do, um, but for the jet Japanese it was quite, a, it was quite an unusual um, gesture. Um, this is a project in Nagoya and it's for a car enthusiast. Uh, Nagoya is the hometown for Toyota, so everybody's sort of car freaks down there. Um, the client... I'm going to find the... I've got a pointer here. Yeah, the, guy, uh, the cl client lives in this awful house here, and he had a stri strip of land about 20 metres uh, along the side of his house, which runs along here on the far side of his house, uh, where he wanted to build a garage for his uh, collection of uh, expensive cars. And it was a very long, narrow site, so we simply made the get, get garage a strip, a driveway which went in, swung up at the back and became a roof. That was it. <coughs> and the cars were the most important thing. So it was just a backdrop really, like a ph photographic back, backdrop for the, uh, for the cars. Very narrow site, so we had a problem with the structure. We couldn't put in columns uh, either side or you couldn't get two cars side, side, side by side. And there's a shot from outside. Uh, it's just got a crinkly tin roof uh, with a sprayed on insulation on the inside. Give some ideas. The guy's got two Ferraris and some uh, Maserati and a, a Porsche. He drives uh, Italian cars and his wife drives German cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's his wife's car. But what, what we did for this was look at really the analogy of the car structure. How, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make the, the um, garage, very, although it's a very narrow site, how can we get the st structure to work? 
where we look, look to the car, and in fact, the actual, these are actually columns, obviously, in the car that support the roof, but you don't read them as columns, they're actually window frames. So here, too, we've used the window frames as mini columns. These are all small columns which support uh, the roof. And also, you know, a car is, has got this 3D form, a curved form, um, to actually make the metal quite strong. It's a very thin plate, and if it was flat, it would dent very easily, so they put a 3D curvature in it. That makes it much stronger. So here, too, we've just used a profile steel sheet roof, which, has got a bent, which is bent in one direction, then we've curved as well, which makes it much stiffer. So this building has basically no columns and no beams, and this obviously caused a big problem at the Japanese uh, local authority when we went to explain the building. It was like it, didn't, it wouldn't stand up. So uh, this took about six months to get through the structural um, uh, exams in Japan. It's quite a difficult uh, prob prob problem, but it, always, it all, all worked fine in the end. Um, we can only build on 60% of the site here, so we've made the building convertible, and this area here is a roof uh, which picks up, um, so the guy can clean his car uh, within, within his garage space. So within, within, within 30 se seconds, the, the roof jacks itself up, becomes like that. So it's quite interesting how the scale of the building changes within the street very quick, quick, quickly, the touch of a remote control, and then the, the front door opens. Slides up, it's like a uh, double hinge. Uh, this is about four years ago, this pro pro project. Um, this is going back to 1998 also. Um, in 1998, the UK Embassy had uh, a fe festival. There were 700 events throughout Japan. It's very much like J2001 here last year. And um, they asked us to decorate the marquee, which was going up on the ambassador's lawn when the prime minister came out. And they have some, well, they actually don't have a marquee. They had to borrow it from the Australian embassy. So I said, well, why don't, instead of decorating, why don't we actually make some, something? And we make it from British materials. And, oh, great idea, great idea. And they've got some cash. So off we went. And we'd been working with Cameron Balloons in Bristol for some time on another project. And so we came together with this idea that we'd have a, have a blow-up pavilion using the best of British. We'd use ca Cameron balloons. Cameron balloons make 90% of the world hot air balloons. Um, and we used prop to mask down in pool to make the structure. So off, off we went, and it came to about £100,000. We went and made the presentation at the embassy, and everything was fine. Until they said, well, they don't have £100,000. They, they said they had money, but didn't have £100,000. They had £18,000, so a shortfall of uh, uh, £72,000. So immediately, well, we're using. So when I was down in Brist Bristol, I saw they're making the balloons for uh, Virgin, uh, for Richard Branson's round the world balloon attempt. So immediately, I got on the phone to the Virgin Atlantic in Tokyo to and said, "Here's your chance to sponsor something on the ambassador's lawn for when the prime minister comes out." Immediately, I got seventy-two thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this was actually something that I was reading the AJ and Martin Pauly was talking about Formula One cars and uh, the America's uh, Cup yachts and talking about spot sponsor sponsorship and whether it was good or bad and he decided it, it was it was perfectly okay so we thought it was perfectly okay too virgin then went and got rover just to soften the blow because they couldn't turn up at the embassy and say we're going to sponsor the whole thing because it really uh pissed british airways off so um that's why that's why land rover's there uh too so this is on the ambassador's lawn when the prime minister was there it became the largest uh, lit bar in Tokyo. Um, we had beer at one end and gin and tonics and pims at the other. Uh, 900 people were there for the event. Um, the building went up 35 times uh, throughout the year. Um, it comes in five units. This is one of the units. Um, each, of the, each of the units has um, four legs, four, four columns, four feet. Um, and it all comes in these four pack, packing cases. Um, the packing cases actually become the pads for the feet, the columns, you know, the columns they bob together. They would come down vertically through this top in here onto, uh, onto the pad. We were never sure whether it was going to be put up on, on grass or on pavers, inside or outside. So we couldn't use the usual sort of tent guy ropes because we had nowhere to stake them in, into. In fact, the ambassador's wife told me that I couldn't put stakes in her lawn. And this is actually why it went this, uh, this route. Uh, she told me that if, if I actually killed her grass, she would kill me. So we were very, very, uh, we were very careful about that. So these pads lightly sat on the ambassador's lawn. Um, problem is that it gets quite windy in Tokyo, and um, uh, Ar Arabs ca calculated there'd be two tons of uplift on that balloon, because it's an aerodynamic shape. So we've got these water bl bladders, which we drop inside uh, the feet of uh, the pavilion, and they take 500 litres of water, so that 
holds it now holds two two tons exactly two tons of uh, of, of weight. Um, just some other rooms that had side curtains too, it had big nappy gutters so where the water came off. And it's a really sim simple thing. This is a zip so you can climb inside and change the light. This is a fan which runs all the time. The uh, uh, envelopes are inflated. And we've just got a bungee rope which runs around it. It's a hook and eye system which you lash these things on. So you put the frame up, inflate the uh, canopy on the floor, and just pop it on top and strap it down. So it's very, very sim sim simple. Um, and it was great working with Cat Cameron Balloons in Br Bristol, working out all these de de details over, you know, on the back of the beer mat. Um, all of the all of the stru structure too uh, was just tongued and grooved, very very simple. Um, four people could put the whole thing up in about four hours. It took just under an hour to put each um, unit up. There it is at a, a rock festival as well. So we had Virgin uh, Megastore cur curtains as well, which we could run around outside. Um, Construction sites in Japan are incredibly tidy um, compared to the UK. That, that is, this is um, this is they're actually dem they're actually demolishing a building behind that. This is the construction fence, and it's obviously got printed I I I ivy on it. This one's got roses on it. It's very nice. Um, so you can imagine our delight, and I've taken loads and loads of photographs of these around Tokyo. So you can imagine our delight when somebody asks us to design a construction fence for a very pr prominent site in the middle of Tokyo. This is 35 meters, uh, 36 meters wide, right in the heart of an area of Tokyo called Harajuku. Uh, it's a fashion dis dis district. And because of this project, we've been actually doing quite a lot of work in, the, in, the, in that area now. So this client has bought a very expensive piece of land and wanted something to, while he's, while he's digging a three-story basement that's going to take a year, uh, he wanted something strange, something to attract attention onto the site. So it's, it's interesting how one project leads to another. So uh, this was two years after the UK 98 pavilion. Um, but when we were looking at this, uh, realizing how we could build um, a construction fence, it was around 10 or 50 meters high at one end. It's 15 meters high here and 10 down this other end. There's a big slope on the site. How, how could we actually do that? Well, things are very expensive in Japan. And just by making a timber um, facade, covering it maybe with steel and then putting a gra graphic on it, it was actually quite, quite expensive. And when we were looking at all the costs and things, it sort of dawned on me that man, if we got those envelopes that we used on the UK 98 pavilion and pop, pop, pop them sort of vertically along the front, it'd actually be much cheaper. These things are not that expensive. So I rang up Cameron Balloons in Bristol, who are now beginning to realize that we do strange things, and said, how much would a lilo cost um, made from that silver stuff you, you fly around the world in? Um, 35 meters long, six meters high, a meter deep. And, uh, it was cheaper than what we would actually it would what would actually cost to put a, um, a wood and metal um, hoarding up. So off we went down that route. Um, it started off as a lilo, basically, just one single or four pieces with a straight top and vertical ribs, and that was the image that we had in our head. And this is quite interesting how design ch changes. Um, during um, the development pr process and just being relaxed about it. Don't get too uptight, let it go in the direction it has to go and don't resist things. So again, we're working with Ove Arup on this pro pro project and they said, well, you know, it's going to blow over in a h high wind, so you're going to need some holes in it. So sure enough, we popped in the holes. And they actually act as the webs. So instead of having the vertical webs, which we normally have in a li lilo, these, these sort of donut shaped webs hold, hold the sides together. So we got rid of the vertical lines. Um, and then we were still struggling to keep this top line here. Well, to keep that top line, Cameron said, well, you're going to need all these, vert all these radial ribs in, in the top just to keep that line straight. And it'd be much cheaper if you actually just rounded them off at the top. And it's like, oh, we don't want any of that. You know, not clouds. So. Um, but then we thought about it more and more, and we looked at lots of archigram pho photographs, and thought, well, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. We'll just leave it like that. And there it is. And uh, it stopped the traffic. Um, it was on TV. It's been in 40 magazines around the world. It's been in 100 magazines in Japan. And they got a lot of mileage um, from this project. Gives you some idea of the, uh, the scale of it. By law, we have to have a metal fence at the bottom. Um, that's it being made in Bristol. Uh, there's a lady there with her, her sewing reel of uh, UV cotton. And there's another lady there. It's kind of funny because right at the end, the whole thing is actually on one needle. The last stitch line they do, it's all being rotated around. One, one needle. 
and it looks like this giant turkey just about to be baked before it, as it's been put up. We've got four, behind each one there are four ver vertical posts, they're 150 in diameter, and again we're using the hook and eyes and the bungee rope, nothing, it's not rocket science at all. Um, and then each one takes about, um, it's about 10 minutes to inflate. You see these people wondering what on earth is going on. You know. so, there you go, and that's inside. So this is the zip that you clamber inside through. These are the lights and the fans that are on the bottom. Um, and these are the webs. These are um, translucent, so we can get some light through at night. And the whole thing glows at night. You can actually hang off of those. There's so much air pressure in there. And there's 250 watt fans that keep that um, inf inflated and pressurized. It can actually survive on one, but obviously... Uh, we've got two there, just a bit of, re a bit of, a bit of redundancy. Yeah, at, there we are at night. So again, it, it, that, that sort of shows that we, we're kind of relaxed about the way we design. We're not too uptight. <clears throat> this, again, is on the same site. So, you know, you don't have to have one idea for one site. Lots, all sorts of different ideas can come across. Come across. Virgin Atlantic saw that uh, balloon uh, the Pika Pika Pretzel installation and said, well, we want one too. And uh, not particularly on this site, but they wanted um, a high visibility campaign. They would normally go to an advertising agency, but they'd seen that the Pika Pika Pretzel, the balloon, the silver balloon, um, had been in so many magazines in t t Tokyo. There was the, sort of this soft ad advertising. Um, we actually call it below the line ad 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 advertising. It's not normal advertising. And I think everybody's getting bored of seeing things in magazines and on TV. There are so many... TV channels that these days, you've no idea of the penetration of, of ads, so people are looking for other ways, and um, we're sort of stepping into that a area quite a lot at the moment. So Virgin asked us to um, raise their profile in Tokyo, and uh, to find a central location. Well, t Tokyo has many locations, central location has Shibuya, has Ueno, there's about 10 large centres, just like the West End, but they're scattered around the centre of t Tokyo, so there isn't one centre. But we've noticed that most people have got mobile phones now, and they're all web-enabled. They've got a thing called iMode on them. And some region of uh, 58 million people, nearly half the population in Japan, have, um, have a mobile phone with this on. So we use that as the center. We said that's the virtual center, and we'll, we'll try and get people excited about that and use that um, as the draw, make that the center. And we'll do something else, uh, elsewhere which links to that. So this is an interactive um, construction fence. Um, it was up for six months, so, sorry, for six, for six weeks. There's a 20 meter long LED tick, tick, ticker tape here. And every hour it asks a question. How many miles between London and, and Japan? How old is Richard Branson? Blah, 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 blah. And um, to answer the question, you have to go onto your, your iMode phone and you can put in the number there. Uh, we used numbers because it was, you know, with all the kanji, kanji and different characters, it's quite difficult. So it was always a numeric uh, number, or sorry, a new, 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 numeric answer. And you, pop, you, pop, you popped in your number and the server would then say, oh, thanks, th thanks for playing the game. You get an email straight back to your phone. And then an hour later, when everybody's answer was in, um, you would get another email saying whether you'd, uh, you got the question. If you got the question wrong, it would tell the answer. If you got it right, it would tell you you'd be put into a draw and then it would say whether you actually won the prize. And they were giving away four flights to the UK a day from this and lots of other prizes too. And uh, so it caused quite a stir. You could only see the question in this part of town, so you had to come. You could obviously log on with your phone um, anywhere in Japan, which said, just said, put the answer to the 10 o'clock question here. So nobody had any idea what the question was. You had to come to this site. And here we had lots of virgin girls giving stuff away. So it, it was a way of playing with technology and media. Um, and we weren't sure what this was in the street. Is it, you know, is, 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 is it architecture? What quite is it? Is it advertising? Uh, we don't really know. Is it an art installation? So, I mean, that all sounds fairly interesting, but the, the most amazing thing was at the press conference where we had somewhere region this number of people in the room, say 200 folks in a the room. They all had a mobile phone. They all played the 10 o'clock question. And because the server can send out 300 mails a second, when it came to 11 o'clock and it mailed everybody out to say what the answer was, 200 phones rang at the same time. All different tunes, um, you know, a couple of people won flights to the UK. So it just shows the power of technology and trying to push, you know, it's, it's existing te technology. The technology exists, it wasn't, wasn't anything magic. Um, it's just trying to think of using it in a different way. So this is just around the corner from um, those construction sites. 
Um, this is the where we, we saw at the beginning the video of the opening of this store. Um, it's a store called La Forêt, which in French means forest. And it's owned by the largest property developer in the world, Mr. Mori, whose surname Mori means forest in Japanese. So we made some trees for him. Um, he's got a, he's got a which, he, which he really liked, actually. Oh. <laughs> um, they've got a, this department store, which is 20 years old. And it's got a street frontage of about 70 meters. Um, and there are lots of concessions happening on the ground floor, one for HMV, one for different stores. They've got a pancake store, they've got a car park entrance, they've got two emergency exits. And, and the, actual, the actual entrance for the store was so small, they were getting very few people into the um, main department store. And the, the main department store holds 150 other stores, so it's kind of important. So we looked at how we could, uh, how we could make an impact along the street front frontage. That luck, luckily, there was a small plaza or a small um, space between uh, the boundary line and, and the store. So we did decided to build, initially we wanted to build a wall along the front, um, something which was quite tough, something which we could put some graphics on and say La Forêt, the name of the store, and maybe make some doorways through it, but it all seemed a bit too hard. So we came up with this idea of um, a row of trees, and the trees are one meter deep, and they act as light boxes, they act as um, display cases. Um, we've got these ones which are cut off, which act as seats here. Um, and when you see it obliquely looking down the pavement, you actually see it as a, as a wall. Um, but as you just turn through 90 degrees, you can actually see into the store. Um, but it would actually make a lot bigger Im impact onto the street fr frontage. Again, what is this? Is it, is, it, you know, is it architecture? Is it advertising? We're not quite sure. Um, give me some idea. Now, these have lights inside. They light up at night. These act as seats here. And then we can change the graphics on, on them. Again, these are graphics done by the guys in the office, the Mikey. They are at night. So let's get through. And a little bit further down the road, <laughs> in exactly the same neighborhood, this is a sister store to La Forêt. This is called Forêt. Um, the story goes that La Forêt, since the renewal, their sales are up by 20% year on year. So they were kind of happy about that. We're thinking about putting our fees, getting the same sort of percentage, because we get a lot better fees that way around. Anyway, um, so sales are up by 20%. They thought, well, we need a little bit more of that. So 400 meters down the road, we've got Forêt, as I say, it's the sister department store. Again, about a 20-year-old department store. Could we do something with the facade? So um, as you saw from... Uh, the last slide, um, Tokyo is incredibly vibrant at night, as you all know, lots of neon and, and, and stuff flashing. And we were trying to find a way to sort of re-reflect that back into the city. So what we've done on this uh, facade is use 6,271 motorway reflectors. They're called delineator motorway reflectors. And they reflect the light directly back into the source from where it came. Um, so that's why you know, the, these reflectors look bright at, at night or during the day. So we get these amazing rainbow effects as the sun comes out. This facade also faces due south. You don't want to live in the off office op op opposite this because it's pretty bright when the, the, sun's, the sun's coming down. Um, but at night, um, that gives you some idea of what it looks like at night. That's with a camera flash. You use one small flash and it lights up the whole facade. I think I've got a shot. There we are when uh, we haven't flashed the camera and if you flash the camera, goes, something like that, which is pretty amazing. They're not lights at all, that's just from a camera flash. So you're getting that effect also as cars go past. Um, when, as, as you walk along the pavement where, I'm, where we're standing taking the photograph, the actual lights from the store reflect onto this and it all flick, fl flickers. Um, it's pretty nice. There's another one more time. Of course, we don't have any planners in Japan, which is, which is kind of great, and uh, we can do whatever we want. So uh, we have no argument with... Uh, with the Royal Fine Arts Commission or anybody, um, except the guys opposite who find it a bit bright in the morning. That's only the problem we've got. Um, it works quite well, actually. Um, it's, there is surprisingly, uh, Tokyo is a surprisingly well-ordered city. It looks fairly chaotic from outside, but um, it's actually quite tightly controlled, um, especially the land uh, zoning and heights and uh, rights of light, th things like that. But nobody 
tells us we can't do it green, nobody tells us we can't use reflectors. Um, so it's a great place when you're young to have an experiment. Um, we also do furniture. We're not really furniture designers. We don't like to call ourselves furniture designers, but we are interested in furniture. We're interested in every part of the building process. Um, and this is quite an interesting project too. This is with Toyo Ito. Uh, this is in his Nagalka Lyric Hall pr project. And one way um, the atelier architects in Japan keep their offices small is by passing out work um, into off offices. Um, we used to work for Ito-san for two, two and a half years, then we left. And within a couple of years, he started passing on work to us. So it's a way that he can trust us. He knows what we do. We know him. And we know the way the office works. Um, and, you know, it helps us along. It helps him. Um, and, you know, the, his, his office is still only sort of 25 folks at the moment, which is pretty amazing considering the, turnout of, um, the, out, the output of work. So this is one of those pro projects. It's within his interior, yet we've done the furniture. And they're called Kuni Kuni Bench. That's been snaky. In, in Japanese. There's a series of random c columns which support the roof and Ito talks about flow and eddies and things like that so we're, we're seeing these benches um, working in a sort of sim similar way. There was, a, um, there was a requirement for all these pole partitions, these pole partitions you have at airports, they, it's kind of like a virus, they infect the world, wherever you go there's a bloody pole partition. And so we decided that uh, we'd actually incorporate these, these, these belt partition things within to the f in, into the furniture. The whole space is in a uh, public route uh, through the theatre. It's 150 metres long. And it's in a c city where you actually can walk through this theatre. It's a part of the public, uh, it's part of a public thoroughfare. Um, and when there's an event, you have a, you know, a ticketed area and a non-ticketed area. And at those times, they want to divide the spaces. So the benches sort of divide the two spaces. And when there isn't an event on, the belts are retracted and you can go through. Um, and when there's an event on, uh, you pull out the bent, you pull out the belts, and they define um, the spaces, something like that. In Japan, it doesn't matter. Nobody will tread over that in Japan. Um, you actually put a stone, which has got a little piece of rope around it tied, and you put it on a pavement. That means stop, and people stop. This is exactly the same. So no problem. Nobody sneaks in. Uh, these are the belts which hook, hook into the uh, hook into the end of the benches. There's where they pull out from. Um, we're also obviously interested in colour, you'll see quite a lot of c c colour in our work, but we're also interested in materials. So within a single bench, you've got um, silks, you've got vinyls, you've got suede, all acting together. Although it's actually blue, there's lots of other te 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 textures you can use as well. <clears throat> this is some furniture for NHK, it's like the BBC of, uh, of Japan, it's in a lobby. Uh, one of our friends designed the building, so we, did, we were doing all the lobby furniture there. Um, We've seen this, it's, it's in a public space, they also use it for TV shoots. Um, we saw this really like a jewellery box where on the, on the outside of a jewellery box, either leather or vinyl, but when you open it, it's actually velvet on the inside. So the inside of these chairs are velvet. And it's where you can put your handbag or your newspaper. When you sit, sit down, you don't actually have to put your bag on the floor, you can slide it um, inside. Also, the, the reason they're this shape is the TV company's logo is like a plectrum, and it's a really 1950s logo with a big, thick black line. And so we just sort of squash that into this, uh, into this chair section pro profile. Uh, made a, a range of benches as well. Um, the idea with the bench is that, you know, when you sit on a bench, you're not quite sure whether you're sitting next to the, the person or not. It's quite uncomfortable sometimes. So the idea is that one person sits here, one person sits here, and there's a little dim dimple here, either, either for a kid or for your bag, but you feel separated on the bench. We've reversed this one. It's velvet on the outside and uh, snake skin on the, on the inside. <clears throat> I think the next one is coming. There we go. Um, again, these are projects that we don't normally show, but I thought it would be quite interesting tonight, a lot of young people, people here. This is a little thing we do at Fuji Rock Festival each year for the British Council, and it's just a blow-up pavilion. Um, their tagline um, uh, at Fuji Rock, and it's a big rock festival, 70% of the bands are from the UK, so their t tagline is, if you don't understand the lyrics, go and study in uh, the UK. And <laughs> pretty sad. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, it's actually very effective, and uh, we sort of make something strange to them each year, so we've made this big totem again. And uh, we really wanted deck chairs, actually. The deck, deck chair is quite an interesting thing because nobody, again, we're not furniture designers. 
and nobody really knows who designed the deck, deck chair. It's incredibly efficient. It folds down to one inch thick. You can slide it under your bed. Um, but you can also use it for all different, if, the different graphics or media. And really, we've begun to work, use the deck chair, something like a T-shirt, and we can do different things with, with it. So for Tokyo Designers Block, uh, just over a year ago, uh, we did some deck chairs for, oops, wrong image. You can punch this material in it. There we are, there's, a, there's the Virgin uh, deck, deck, deck chairs. So these can be arranged, they can be random within the space and nobody knows what you're advertising, but you can put them together and take a nice photograph, gift to the client and say, look, these are, you can advertise your product with these. Um, but it's quite an interesting thing, you know, it's a piece of furniture, but you can have fun with it and it's very simple and cheap and they're very happy. The little windows and the graphics on them. Kids, kids love these. They get around the back and look through. Mm -hmm. So then we took that a bit further. We made a, a deluxe version with uh, with a very gaudy uh, sequined uh, material, and we call this one the next one Tom Tom, because um, Tom Dixon was in town, and he had this you know this extrusion machine he has where it pumps out this hot pla plastic, and you have to make something with it live on stage. So we made a deck chair uh, with it, a deck chair cover. Which is really nice, which somebody sat in, and of course it just all broke. <laughs> so, um, this is just recently in the summer at Tokyo Kokusai Forum. It's the uh, the international forum which Raphael Vinoli designed. Uh, I guess you've all seen in the magazines. Uh, this is huge glass volume, ship vo volume, ship shaped volume, um, next to a very stoic series of th th theaters. And there's a, in between these two v volumes, there's an open plaza which is very very dead, and. Uh, for its fifth year anniversary, there was a three-day art event. David Byrne was showing some stuff. They asked us to do the plaza. Um, and we had, I don't know, it was about 15,000 pounds or something. And then they said, we've well, got to have guards there every night. So you suddenly, you know, 12,000 pounds were spent on these damn guards. So we were left with 3,000 pounds to decorate this massive plaza. So in Japan, I'm, I don't think you have them here, but they have like a dollar store. Um, there are 100 yen stores in Japan. There's hundreds of them. And everything, so we thought, we've got no money, so we're just going to buy a lot of something. And what's the most stuff we can get with 3,000 pounds? We can buy 3,000 things at a, a, at a, a one, 100 yen shop. So these are all 100 yen. And we made a series of installations throughout the plaza using uh, things which cost 100 yen. Uh, <laughs> so it's called the 100 yen International Plaza. Um, so actually, these were 200 yen. These were 100 yen. <laughs> and they're filled with water. And it's in, it was in, um, uh, in August, so it's quite hot. So during the day, it all starts off as fairly sort of stoic, too. And then it all begins to break down. Oh, that's the casino square. So, and these all blow around in the wind. They're quite nice. They're filled, the pools are filled with water. Um, and then slowly, people began to, sat, to sit in the seats. These seats are sitting within the water. Again, this cost about 20 pounds, this piece here. And we put them in, and this is Richard Long here. And he did something inside him. Um, and then as it, got, as it got to the evening, we have a little wind-up fish that swam around as well. But then people started to sit, sit in them and inter interact with this. And it just got kind of, kind of really crazy. <laughs> then we realised why we needed the guards. You know. <laughs> But it, it, it made us realise how dead this space really was, and they really, they really do need to do something there. I mean, it's normally e completely empty. Um, so. <laughs> That's the shot looking through the big glass volume, looking out into the plaza. The last one. Um, Again, this is, um, we get asked to do all sorts of strange things. Um, this is for Tamiya, uh, the model comp company. They had a 50th year anniversary and they asked lots of different designers to, to work with some of their models. And so As Astrid is looking through the, uh, the catalog and couldn't believe all these tanks and war things. You know, so she said, well, let's, um, let's see what color does to uh, these tanks. And so we've got a, uh, we've got a next slide here, I think. Um, we've, got a, we've got a wedding tank here. 
and we've got a uh, samba tank here, and this one's called Pretty in Pink, a little <laughs> bird coming out of the it's all, but again, it's, all of these things are great for the off, for the staff in the office. It keeps them moving. It keeps them. You know, this is you know three or four days or something. We've got to get this thing out. Um, and you know, it, it makes you think about materials. It makes you think about colour. Makes you think about humour. You'll see that humour is quite important in our work. Um, it's quite a difficult balance, and I think you have to practice with that. Um, you really can't just go for the big belly laugh or all the time. People are going to get bored of it. But people sort of like to smile. Pe 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 people like a joke. People also remember a joke. And uh, I think that you know a lot of architecture is way too serious, and so this is this is good uh, this is good practice. Um, earlier, you saw the the bus outside of our office for uh, the jam exhibition. This is actually the jam exhibition in Tokyo. I guess quite a few of you went to the jam when it was in Barbican last year. Um, this is in Tokyo Opera City. Uh, it's quite a large gallery, much different to uh, the gallery in London. And we had this problem that all of the art was actually quite small in comparison to the gallery. We had to find a way to connect it together. It would look quite weak. Um, so the whole exhibition was about artists, street culture artists from uh, Tokyo and London. And the more we looked at it, we realized that actually shopping was the link. Um, a lot of things like Bathing Ape and Undercover all have this um, very strong street culture link. So shopping uh, was kind of the key. So we. But what we do is we get a load of shopping bags because they're free, and that's a kind of important thing. And uh, we get lots of them, and there was very little money for this ex exhibition. And so we hung these huge banners of bags from the ceiling. Um, half of them are from London, well, so a third of them from London, a third of them from Japan, and a third of them for uh, the, the actual logo from the, uh, the exhibition we made our own bags. Um, so when you walk into the space, the impact initially is all of these bags, and then your eye is brought down. Um, to the art level. So it's not really fighting so, so much with the art. Um, it's quite interesting how some of the bags seem to match uh, the art quite well. It's quite ran random how p people were selected to go into the booths uh, below. But also you have to think about the detail of how the bags go together. Um, it's not just uh, you can't, the, the, how, how are you going to hang these bags. So actually hung on a, there's a, there's a plastic sheet which is behind them and they're just stuck on with uh, real men tape. But then how do you do the corner? Do you do a mise corner or do you do, quite how does it all go together? So you, wanna, you need to think about these things. So initially you think it's really simple idea, but it, there is this connection back through to, to architecture all the time. Oops. That's one of the booths you can see there. The, the, the play with the, uh, with the bags. This is our installation within the space. Um, as I say, there's five co companies within Deluxe. So this is the Deluxe installation. And we're kind of fed up with, the, um, with, with all of these DVDs and video this and video projection that. So we just took a simple um, electronic flip over clock and rewired it so it flips over once a second. So these things just flip over. And we've stuck our work on instead of the numbers. So. Um, within a minute you'll see 60 of our projects flip, flip, flipping over and then this one will flip, flip over after that. And then we've put it on this uh, wall, wall, wallpaper which Namaiki um, designed. And again, they felt that there was so much colour within the exhibition, so many, so many people were using this sort of very highly rendered um, computer gra graphics, they'd go for a very simple black and white bold wallpaper. Um, that's us. Um, this was in this was April in Milan, and we were invited by Interni, the Interior magazine, to make um, an installation in one of the plazas in the middle of Milan, um, along with Leon Crea, Eisenman, uh, Mendini, Fuxas, Oscar T Tuskets, and uh, I think that was it. Um, so um, it was it was about making a, just a plaza, making an ob object within a public space. And you had to use a material that you were given or you, you, you wanted to, 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 to work with. This is Bernard Schumi's installation. Uh, he was u being sponsored by a, uh, an aluminium extrusion company. So it's all covered with these aluminium extrusions. Uh, this is Peter Eisenman. And he was being sponsored by uh, Barasola, a stretched ceiling manufacturer. It all sort of fell down because you've got to have this to protect it from the rain. But it was actually a really nice... Inst installation and it was called Void. It was just a, it was just a hole 
uh, but I was very, very impressed with that. Um, this is Leon Korea. And it had a grand piano inside. It was about, it was about um, playing a piano within the city. And was actually really nice too. And uh, a very nice juxtaposition with the, uh, or nice composition with uh, the buildings behind. Uh, Fuchsas never quite finished theirs. Um, <laughs> um, it, did, it did actually get finished by the end of the exhibition. Um, but this is, it's a kind of a space thing. It's got, a, it's got popcorn and stuff as insulation within these bags. It was actually very nice. And, um, when this next thing? We made a, uh, we made a bath. Uh, we made the most private space in the most, pu in the most public space. Uh, this is next to Aldo Rossi's uh, water monument in uh, Croce Rocha. Uh, right next to this is Imani Superstore here. So it's right in the middle of Milan. And we work with a company called Technogel. And te Technogel is uh, this material here. I don't know if you can, you can see that. It's uh, an amazing material. It's called memory gel. It will always, always return to its, uh, um, its um, original state. It's just amazing to play with. And if they're based in, they're just based outside of Milan. And uh, they, it's being used more, more, more and more now. Uh, originally it was used in uh, wheelchair seats and for surgical pillows and things like that. Um, now lots of other sort of furniture designers are using it for seats in chairs and different things. And we saw this as an opportunity to make the bathroom softer, but bathrooms are actually quite dangerous things. They're, 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 they're tiled, lots of glass or stone, and, and when they get wet they're actually very, very slippy. And so with the advent of these new materials, this is 100% polyurethane, um, we felt that we could actually sort of push uh, the bathroom into a new direction, so come up with this gummy bath, like gummy bear, gummy bath. Um, so here we are telling the tale in Milan. Um, and it's just a very simple um, acrylic base. And again, we've taken the cue from the bathroom and we actually tiled it. You know, it's it's not, not taking the idea too far. And so all of these are made from soft, and even the bath here, the bath side, it's uh, 30 centimeters, uh, 30 millimeters thick, wobbly. Um, things. And when you fit, fill it with water, the whole thing bulges out. There's the shower. And obviously we've used the duck motif as a, as a joke. People love to pull the, pull the, pull the beak on it. It's, uh, it's, fair, it's nice and wet. It just it happened to be the rainiest Milan furniture fair ever, I think. It rained every single day for uh, a week. But it, it, hadn't rained, it hadn't rained for two months. And the night before it rained, and the, the, whole of the, the whole of the Sahara Desert seemed to fall out of the sky. Uh, with, with the rain. It was, it was a very, very weird uh, few, few days. Any, any opportunity to get our name <laughs> into things. <laughs> um, but it was very interesting how the colour within this very sort of grey uh, cityscape worked, this very classical cityscape. There it sits. Uh, Had a car done as well with it, so we drove around the furniture fair in your car. And then it's, it was taken to Tokyo for um, the furniture fair there. It was only meant for Milan, and then um, the guy who imports all the Vitra furniture into Japan um, had it shipped, shipped, shipped over. So this was, this was in October in t Tokyo. It's outside Sejima's building. Um, there you can see the sink. Again, that's all made just from a sh single sheet of this, which is pulled down with the weight of the... Um, the downpipe, and so you can push into that. Um, it is totally amazing material. It's sort of a, every, you know, every, everybody wants to play with it, you know, and it's very easy to understand. Um, although we have got the explanation there, we say, you know, a lot of we tell our students that you know the, the work has got to speak for itself. You can't you can't stand there and explain it to folks, and uh, it's the same for. Like Lafare with the trees and things like that, that, that you know, it, it's got to be understandable, and everybody could um, really understand what, what was going on here quite easily. Um, again, this is to do with soft, softening the bath a little bit more. Again, one of these quick projects within the office. It was for a materials exhibition, um, and we've we're developing. We're actually developing this as a pr product at the moment. Um, these are soap sinks. They're made of soap, so you never, you never have to lose your soap again. Um, all, you, all you do is you rub the sides, and uh, you're away. And so the whole point is of this: it will actually change 
um, over, over time, during a six, six month period, your sink will get deeper and smaller to a point where you take it away and you buy a new one. So soap companies love this because they use a lot of slope. But um, this one is a, a lemon uh, sink. This one's a vanilla sink. But it's this whole sort of wabby sabby feeling, this very Japanese uh, feeling, like a, like a pebble on a beach um, that's w washed up and it just changes over, over, over time. But again, as I say, it's all about softening your bathroom. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about our interiors. Um, you may have seen this in quite, quite a few mags. It's for uh, Bartle, Bugle, Hegarty. They're the advertising agency for Levi's Worldwide. They've got a small office in Japan, about four people, and they wanted to have a Japanese office. Uh, for that, 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 for us, it doesn't mean tatami mats or shoji screens. It means something a little bit more uh, sort of thoughtful or jokey, whatever we want to look at it. So we use this traditional Japanese way of seating. It's called a horikotatsu, where you actually uh, sit on the fl sit on the floor, but you can put your feet in in a, in, in a hole. Um, and we use these Japanese cushions, the zabuton, as well. Client also doesn't like the traditional Japanese fl fluorescent lights, which are awful, and they're in every single office. So we've just turned the lights off, and we've lit everything with angle poise uh, lamps. This is an um, office for Virgin Atlantic. It's just a refit on, on their office. Uh, when you walked into their space, all you saw was all these printers and fax and copiers, and there was just so much tech technology there. So we've just covered it with a very large uh, silver fuselage or wing, and we're having uh, jokes with that. It says, uh, in case of urgent photocopy, cut here, so you can clamber through onto the other side um, where there is a photocopier. Um, this is the reception area here, all done in sort of red tra translucent glass. Um, this is an interior for a um, um, vegetarian fast food rest, re restaurant called a Veggie To Go. Um, and it's strange how materials, you find materials. Um, we were thinking of putting real grass along here, but there's a maintenance pro pro problem. You can't keep, keep it, uh, you can't keep it maintained, but very easily it's a real pain. So um, Astrid was at home painting her toenails with this, you know, there's a funny things you can put between your toes and they separate your toes. When, I don't know anything about this. But apparently, you put them between your toes. Well, this thing she had was bright green and sort of spongy. So um, that's what those are made from. They're made, from, they're made by actually the same co company who makes the toe separators. Um, but it's just funny how you have to keep your eyes open. All the furniture's made from uh, pressed bamboo. Uh, so we've been quite uh, as environmentally friendly as you can. These, these are made from soup bowls. Um, let's see. You can see these, these are the, the funny things. And again, the graphic designers were working on uh, the graphics for this, and it's, should, should we have a bean, or should we have a lettuce, or should we have, and we said we would have them all, you know, it'd be quite nice. So, not just a single. So, again, this came with, with the graphic designers. This is a small office for AMP. Um, they're an Australian, I think they're here, aren't they? Um, it's an Australian financial com company. Um, we've used, on the meeting rooms, there's a big uh, line of me meeting rooms. We've used the same film as they use on buses, this one-way graphic film. So when you're inside the office, because it's an Australian com or company, you have the outback scene on, on this glass. When you go inside and look out, you actually can't see the graphic. So it's quite dynamic just in one direction. Um, so again, you have to keep your eyes peeled. They use this on the back of taxis, so it's quite subtle. Um, and it's got this very different effect to just a, just a translucent photocopy film, which you see all the time. The fact that when you go into the meeting room, it disappears. It's quite a shock for the guests. And this is within the same office. You know, within Japanese offices, there's very little space, so you have to be quite click clever. So this is the reception area and the chill out area for the staff. Um, it's this sort of tunnel of love. Uh, you can sit and look at the Australian mangroves while you're having your cup of coffee or while you're waiting. Adjacent here is just all desks and stuff. So within this tiny, tiny space, we've made quite a dramatic um, ent entrance area for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the company. And then all of these slides, so in the evening these can all be slid back um, and opened up. And you can actually open the bar to the main off office space. Um, this is a project, it's been published in Frame just recently. Um, it's for an advertising agency called Beacon. They occupy these five floors. Uh, within this building. This building is quite interesting because it's um, in Japan there are very few air, air rights buildings. It's built over a station and uh, the railway tracks run actually under this building here but this is built completely over a station so it's column free 
um, space, which is quite unusual in Japan. Um, each floor is about a thousand square meters. I say they took five um, floors, and we had to develop this advertising agency within there. Uh, only problem was that uh, the advertising agency didn't exist. It was a merger of three agencies, and nobody had any idea how they were going to organize their staff, except we've got to design it. So um, we sort of scratched our heads a little, little bit and took a very relaxed approach to it, in fact. Um, I don't have any plans, unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's, it's a 15 meter wide space, it's 70 meters long. And we just made a zone within the space again, adjacent to the core wall where we put all of the meeting rooms, put all of the ancillary spaces, the printer centers, everything that wasn't in the main space, everything that wasn't a part of the office. So we have a zone of just office desks, then we have a zone of ancillary spaces. And we did no adjacency tests, we did nothing. We just assumed that people would use the office uh, the meeting space, the printer centre that, that, that was nearest them, and it'd be completely flex, flex, flexible. Um, and because the agency would change up over time as well, there's no point in looking at all this adjacency stuff. So very simple, two, st two strips, one strip of, of meeting desk, or sorry, uh, of office desk, one strip or ribbon of ancillary spaces. So this is the ancillary space. This is the reception area, and we've t chosen this ribbon motif, which becomes a, a seat, and it becomes a, another office and trundles off for 60 meters through the space. You can see it trun tr trundling off there. Again, we have to deal with you know, the escape for wheelchairs and things like that. So it's, it's broken in some areas, but generally it's uh, one, one piece. Um, there are, there are, they've taken five floors, there are ribbons on four of the floors. And when we were looking at how we would divide up uh, the agency, we realized there were quite strong brand groups. And you wouldn't be able to do this in, in America, but we, we developed a male floor. We developed a female floor and a family floor and a community floor. Community means management, really. But anyway, so this is this, this is the management floor. So we've done it in white. It's very pure and uh, uh, unbiased colour, um, but bright green, bright green floor. Uh, and you can see the ribbon run, running away there. And within this ribbon, as I say, there are these there are these areas. We're trying to make people stop within the agency and look at things. So we've got these small amphitheatres, these steps. Um, you can sit there and watch videos. They're playing videos all the time of different, di different ads from around the world. Um, so this whole ribbon was meant to be the fun bit uh, within the space. The other thing was, this is, the, this is quite interesting too. Everybody within the office, there, there, were, there were no offices at all. Even uh, the president and the five directors, none of them have an office. So this is a single table, 12 meters long. And this is the president's chair. It's a throne that she sits on. <laughs> And uh, the finance director sits here, creative sits here, and the other guys sit there. Um, they all have nice chairs, which, are, which they pick themselves from the cat catalogue. This is a yellow, vit yellow vitra chair, yellow. Very, very nice. Um, and around it, we've got 20 chairs, plywood chairs from Jasper Morrison. And the idea is that anybody can draw a chair up and have a chat to the management. They don't, they're really scared, but um, the idea is there. And so we put these ducks also down the middle of the table just to make it a bit softer and uh, a little bit more light-hearted, light, light but it works really, really well. Um, and what the management team have, dis have discovered on this t table is they have real-time communication. That means talking. And uh, they're so used to sitting in offices and where they actually send an email to one another um, that this was, this was a revelation to them, that they could talk to one another. They don't have to send an email. Um, and it's, it's worked really well. So in the morning, everybody at 8.30, 9 o'clock, everybody's around this table working and they can hear te telephone conversations go, going on, things like that. This, this whole idea um, stemmed from our first meeting in Deluxe, in our office, in, in the, the warehouse. We had a meeting with 20 of their staff and all of the directors and we all sat around one of our tables. And other things were going on. Mike came past with these crates of beer and there's somebody else is having a meeting over there. And at the, at the end of it all, they said, well, we want some of this. We want some, we want some life within our office. And uh, this led to the open plan office, and nobody, nobody was worried about it at all, because that's how we run our office, and they could see that operating. So it's kind of in, in, interesting. This, uh, this office is 320 pe pe people, so if we got it wrong, it was kind of, it was kind of really bad. But they're very happy. Uh, I got a phone call six months after this was opened, and I was dreading a phone call from the president saying, ring her back. And she rang up to say it's working, and we've never had, we haven't had one problem. So uh, that's quite unusual for an office this size. Gives you an idea of that, the, the dining table. Anyway, so here we are on the family floor. We did the family floor with that's where the Disney brands ha hang out, and Kellogg's and Kraft and stuff like that. So we've done this floor in um, 
we've done the rib rib ribbon here in timber, just a sort of, sort of family softer uh, feel. There's our family. Uh, and this has got a, just a, a blue floor, quite strong blue floor. All of the furniture within every, you can see just the Herman Miller general office stuff. It doesn't matter what, we, we, we weren't uh, worried at all about what that furniture was. It was, it was the furniture that, that, that met the cost, with the best cost performance. Um, you know, the, it's, it's just office furniture. It's not, it's not that important. Everybody uses this. This is where we try to concentrate the money. Again, this is a fairly low cost project. It's not, it's not, um, it's not really expensive. And we've tried to make every room di different. So every room has different furniture. Every single room. There's 150 different furniture types. And there's somewhere in the region of 1,200 if you take the different types of fabric that we've used on, on the chairs, uh, which makes a sort of an ordering nightmare. Um, this is the kitchen um, within the family uh, ribbon. So there they're working on um, washing powders and washing up liquids and things like that, so they can actually uh, use those, some very nice Azumi stools. Um, and you can just see the office um, to, to the back. This is another through route, um, one of the fire escapes through, so we've chosen to make it a tunnel. This is on the mail floor. The mail floor is done in stainless steel uh, with a purple, a nice purple floor. Well, that was very male. Um, and again, we've used lots of, uh, lots of different types of masculine furniture uh, within the rooms. There, you haven't seen the women's floor yet, you see. It's nice Jasper Morris and stuff in there. It was really great fun just choosing this. And this, compared to normal office furniture, it's, not, it's no more expensive. You know. But it gave every room a different f feel. Some Philip Stark prison chairs. And a pink leather, oh, sorry, a purple leather, that's a purple leather table. And here we are on the women's floor. Um, 60 meters of pink snake skin, uh, which ripples its way through the office. A little bed here. <laughs> it was quite, you can imagine trying to persuade the client to go for that, can't you? Um, Astrid actually wore a pink snakeskin belt that day, which, which tipped the balance and we were, we were away. Um, it's, it's pink wallpaper, it's American wallpaper, and we've scanned it and printed it onto vinyl uh, floor tiles. You can't see that yet. Again, another room, all different furniture. I think you'll see the floor tiles in a minute. Yeah, here's, here's some of the floor. So we, we just scanned, we, we scanned the wallpaper and there's, a, there's a, some guy in Tokyo who prints onto vine, uh, vinyl tiles and it doesn't seem to come off. So um, we've got pink snakeskin floor as well. Again, the office furniture just running away. So behind this sort of, you know, uh, this sort of just the regular office furniture. You've got the ribbon uh, going up and down at the back, and of course, no woman's floor would be complete without a hair salon and a manicure centre. So again, again, there's the office. It's not very far away, and you can see our um, pink snakeskin um, floor. Again, they do all the advertising for Vida Sassoon and things like that. So they actually use this. They actually have a, a, a head, hairdresser come in on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and as somebody who manicures their, their, their nails and things. Okay, so I thought I'd talk about some buildings now, um, the interiors. Um, this is a, a house we completed at the end of last year. Uh, it's in Shimoda. It's about two and a half hours by train, um, let's say south of Tokyo. Uh, it's in one of the most um, volcanic regions, or most uh, seismic uh, re regions of Japan. Um, it's within a national park and it's quite interesting for us because uh, we have to have a pitched roof in a national park. It's one of the only planning re regulations there is in Japan and um, we're not allowed to use any colour which is, which, is which is a bit of a shame. Anyway, um, it's built on a very very steep slope uh, and it's basically a huge uh, sand dune so there's no um, there is no uh, bedrock at all so it's actually like a large boat which sits on this on this sand, and we've cantilevered out quite quite a long way over the over the cliff. Um, the it, it looks as you, you saw from the first photograph. It looks over the beach. Um, there's a 270 degree um, view from the house, 
and the client wanted an all glass building and uh, the only problem is it's, it's hit by typhoons. It's already been hit four times, almost direct hits by very strong typhoons. And if you've got an all glass building, they don't sort of mix. And we have to find a way to uh, cope with that. Now we could toughen the glass, but that's very expensive. And again, it isn't always uh, uh, the safest route. That's not our furniture, by the way. Um, so it gives you some idea of the view. Um, and we also felt if it was an all glass building, it'd be too exposed and there'd be too much um, sun. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've just used reg regular glass in, in, the, in, in the windows, but we've used these fiberglass, um, these F FRP screens, which they're normally used in factories for floor gratings. And we've done it up through 90 degrees, turned into a, a screen. They're incredibly strong. And the problem with typhoons is not really the wind pressure, but it's the wind-blown de de debris, bits of log and twig and stuff hit hitting the glass. So these just act as um, a windbreak and a protection from all of the wind-blown uh, materials. So there they are. There's the house completely closed up. Um, again, they, the, the client could be away for a couple of weeks, and uh, it's not there. So if there's a typhoon, or all, all, all the screens are across, then they can... Um, what are they? They're still, they're, st they're still away in this slide. Um, aha, they've come home. Yeah, now they can open all the screens up. Uh, and look out. Um, the screens act also in, in a quite a nice way. They actually contain the space when you're in the house. Again, we are worried it would just be way too open. All the materials are galvanized um, steel or stainless steel as because it's coastal. And it turns very Japanesey at night. So that's um, our first house as such. Um, this is a project for um, Undercover. It's a fashion brand, fashion company in Japan. Uh, the design is called Jun Takahashi. He's just had his first collection in Paris. Um, he's 30. He has about uh, 20 stores throughout Japan and is seen as one of the, the new young guns. Um, Japan fashion has been fairly static for a few years. Uh, it's, just, it's just beginning to uh, start up again. It's all because of the recession. The recession's good, actually. Um, it means that people don't have jobs and they've got to do things on their own. So they set up fashion brands. They do, you know, they'll set up a t-shirt company, run a caf cafe. And for us, it's the most exciting time in Japan because of the recession. Um, things were kind of, um, kind of slow when, when we first arrived. There, there was, it was fast, it was, there was lots, of, lots of stuff going on when we arrived in, in the height of the bu bubble, but it was all kind of, it was all kind of nouveau riche. Now as there's a lot of sort of, um, it's a lot more taste to everything. Um, uh, they say aji in, in Japanese. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot more gritty. And I think, you know, when you see what the, the recession did to the UK in say the 70s, and out of that became, became the punk revolution, I think this, this big downturn in Japan has sort of helped help Japan creatively. And this is one of the designers, as I say, he's 30 years old and doing incredibly well. And his collection went down very, very well in Japan. This site, again, very tight site in Japan, um, four meter wide roadway, which leads to a 10 meter square site at the back. And how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you make a building which has got an impact? Um, the other thing was they wanted to park five cars on the site as well. It's not only a tiny site, they wanted parking for five cars. So we, when we looked at the brief, we realised that we could actually do something over this roadway that led into the site, and uh, we'd build a container or something above it, but we couldn't put any co columns down because it would make it too narrow to drive the car through. Um, so we had to go about suspending or cantilevering um, this box. The client also wanted uh, a rail for the, the press collection, the collection of his clothes, which was 20 metres long. And the only 20 metre length of the site actually ran down here, because it was 10 by 10 at the back. So this is how this box came about, and then we had to realise we couldn't put any columns there. So it was, it's cantilevered, and I'll show you how that's done in a minute. Um, so within the tube, there's the, there's the press rail there with all the clothes on it. That's where all the buyers come and, when they're talking to the magazines. Um, you can see the tube here just cantilevering out. We've got a catwalk on the roof here too. There's no suspension w wires or anything at all. It's just a Virendil frame which sticks out from the building. Um, the guy's a bit of a punk and he keeps talking about UK and London this and London the other. So we imported 20,000 London bricks. Uh, they're London yellows. And you can imagine the, the look on the guy's face in... in uh, yeah, I went a mile into Lasden's, the second hand 
brick company said, I want 20,000 bricks for Japan. Um, but again, we're not too worried about it, you know. Um, we wanted to actually print them onto the, uh, you kept going on bricks all the time. And I was like, Jesus. And so we wanted to, we wanted to tattoo them onto the building or print them onto the co concrete. In the end, we just used real bricks. I just forgot about it. Um, but it gives it this nice, uh, it's a nice con con contrast. Um, he also doesn't like um, fair face concrete. He's not an Ando fan. He doesn't want to see any exposed co concrete at all. So everything behind here is concrete, here too. But we've just chosen to leave the formwork on. We haven't taken the formwork off. So you have put the wooden formwork there, leave it alone. And uh, it's, it's, it's cheap. There we are to sort of 20th, mid-century mid furniture. And that's all concrete too up there. Within, uh, I should have said, between the, um, you've got the main block, which is the, uh, which is the design studio, and then you've got a, a circulation zone which runs down a uh, staircase. This is all this, again, this is, there's reinforced concrete behind here, fair face concrete, and that's just the formwork, so you get all the concrete juice just dripping down. So it's actually very, it's, it's very nice, the balance between the very fine um, expanded mesh on the floor, and then you've got this quite earthy uh, feel to the thing. So the tube is on, on my left, and this is the design studios on the right. Okay, so this is quite difficult for the Japanese magazines to get their heads around because they're normally white and stainless steel or al al aluminium. We, again, putting a lot more colour and texture into our um, work. So how, how, how do we make this, uh, this thing stand up? Um, as you can see, that's from the back looking forward. It, from here to here is 10 meters, pure cantilever. And there it is going up. Um, they're like 150 square members, H members. It's, 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 you know, it's, just a, it's just a truss here. It's, um, they've just propped it on columns here just to support it as they, as they put it together. This is, from this point forward, it's cantilevered. So there's just a big Virendil frame which can, comes out of the building. There's one here and one at the back, and that's it. There, there's one here, one here, one at the back, one here. It is quite springy <laughs> at the front if you jump up and down. When I came to site one day, they'd, uh, when they got this up, the, the only way they could get materials in is by putting them in through the tube. So I turn up one day and they've got, they've got two piles of plasterboard, 100 sheets thick. There's two tons of plasterboard at, at, the, at the far end. And uh, it's amazing you can take that weight. If you jumped up and down, it didn't move one inch. It was, it was under so much tension. I think you'll see in the next. Uh, yeah, that's that's it there. That's the one that supports it. It's not much. Okay. Um, these are a couple of projects. Uh, one more project to show after this. Uh, but these are a couple of projects that are in the office right now. It's a ten-story building in Nagoya. It's an apartment building. Um, the sites, uh, the building's nine meters wide at the front, seven meters wide at the back, thirty-one meters high, and the piles go down forty-one meters. So there's more underground than there is above ground. Uh, this is a small house we're doing in the center of Tok Tokyo. It'll be on site uh, in April. A uh, little fashion store that's on, on, ongoing. And a restaurant we're doing at the top of Jean Nouvel's new building for Dentsu, the big advertising agency in Japan. And that opens on Saturday. Uh, so this is the final project. Um, this is for Bloomberg. Uh, the um, financial news com company, very similar to Reuters, and it's they've they've moved their offices into a new building, and on the ground floor they've got a retail space, and they asked us to design a, an internet cafe, or a, or, or something, um, to really promote the Bloomberg name, and what we came up with was was something a little bit more playful. Uh, we felt that in internet cafes had been done. How could we how could we interpret um, their um, uh, their their com company. They play with data. They're in, they're a news har harvesting company. So um, we were looking at a way to play with data. So we've got this large stalactite which hangs from the ceiling, and going through this, we've got ticker tapes um, of the Nasdaq, the FTSE, uh, the FT, and you can actually play with that. You can move it around. The 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 um, the, 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 the the data um, sort of plays with itself as as it were. 
it, when, the, when the stock is down, the actual, the, the, that's a stock ticker, will get small. If the stock's up, it gets bigger, you actually see the volume. We, we actually, when we installed it, we thought there, thought there was a bug because everything was going down, but it was, it was, it was just the stock market was crashing. Um, and every few minutes, a, um, uh, a, a menu will come down. And there are four other games. You can play this harp. You can move your hands across it. I've got a video in a second. Um, or you can turn it into this digital shadow and as you walk past. Every 10 centimeters behind that, um, you've got uh, these infrared sensors, very much like a remote control on the TV. And they're, they're sensing all the time. And they can detect you when you're within about 50 centimeters of the glass. Um, so this is white glass, you've got white LEDs operating or working behind this, 80,000 LEDs in this. Um, and then there's a connection game where, where one or two people can play and you can sort of join the dots as it were. Um, you'll see it in a second. Or you can play volleyball. There's a volleyball game on there. Um, so there's back to the menus. Uh, but it is, it, is, it is very, very interactive. The, 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 the density of the sen sensors is uh, quite tight at 10 centimeters. Oh, that's from outside. And it's been this huge hit. Um, you actually can't get in there on a Saturday. There's so many people sort of que queuing up to get in. Um, and Bloom, Bloomberg are really happy. Lots of young kids playing with salary men, with office workers. Um, there's a really nice crossover of pe pe people. Um, and the whole thing makes, um, make, makes a sound too. I think I'll be able to switch that on in a second. So that's the digital harp. And we worked, uh, this was done in conjunction with um, a media artist called Toshio Iwai, who's probably one of the leads, world's leading um, in, in, interface designers. Um, what we realized with this project is that um, it's probably only about 10% about design. It's about um, persuading the client. Um, it's about being a salesman um, or a diplomat uh, or a director, trying to explain to the client, this is what you're going to get. They've never seen this before. They've no idea what they're getting. They're spending $2 million on this. And you've got to persuade them. That's, that's a part of the job. It isn't just, it is, isn't just about design. Um, you've got to reassure them that it's, it's going to work. You know. Sorry, we'll get there in a second. So this way you can push around the, uh, the data with your hand. It's very strange. You can just see these little dots. These are the shadows of the sensor holes behind the, uh, behind the glass. Take that out. So that's the harp, and you can... It's me showing off as well, by the way. And then if you wait, the, uh, the menu will drop down if you leave it for five seconds without interacting with it. This is a digital shadow. So you, you don't have to touch it, you can just get quite close to it. Yeah. But it can actually sense, as you get closer, that the, the signals get stronger. <laughs> then this is the digital connection. So if you're just on your own, you can... <laughs> Caleb, my friend, is getting quite excited at this point on the left. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you connect together. So it's really strange seeing you know, p people who don't know one another playing with this and realizing there's a connection. <laughs> and you leave it rest and it will go back to the menu. So this is, Japanese love volleyball, so. Uh. <laughs> Great. 
grown up men, you know. A little bit how 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 do we do that type thing here? Um, go back this a shot. The, that glass is um, 5.4 meters wide. It's 3.5 meters high. It's got a curve at the top end just here. It's 12 mil thick. It's museum glass. So it's not green. It's white. And uh, there's two pieces because it's like a stalactite hanging from the ceiling. And how do they get that into the building? Well, it comes in a big crate. It takes 30 guys uh, to manhandle it into the space. This is 10 days before it opens, and it takes a month to make a new one if they break it. Um, and it's just, in a, it's just in this sort of packing case, and uh, nobody seems to be taking any care with it at all. Uh, but they are. Um, and then they have to pick this thing up. It weighs uh, 700 kilos, uh, nearly, nearly a ton. And it's going to be manhandled through this. We have to take a piece of glass out to get it in, all the suckers. There's a lot of shouting that goes on, and if anybody says a tataru, which means it's about to touch something, they all stop and go incredibly quiet. Um, and then they have to lift it from there up to the space. That's what's inside. Um, again, we have to think about earth earthquake with this. I mean, there's you know, a ton and a half of glass hanging down. This whole thing is, it can't shake around too much. That's why it's got this deep depth. We've also got to find a way to maintain the, the LEDs inside. These are, these are sliding rails, so the LEDs can actually slide out at the end, this door opens and you can take the LEDs out. You can do sim simple maintenance from underneath and climb inside. Here's the LEDs going in, that's an LED panel, that's 10 by 10, the centers are the corners. So we had to make the LED, the back into the LED black, so, sorry, white instead of black. Um, it made it look a lot fresher. If the whole thing was, was dark and black, it looked very sort of dated. So we got them to make these special um, white LED bases. So again, on site looking, just seeing how bright they are, what and then we put a, f a white film, translucent film, over them just to try and make them sort of look really magical. You really get, you get no sense that there's anything behind the glass at all until, you, until the LED's on. And again, looking from outside, seeing how bright they are. Okay, um, just to wrap up, um, I talked about Deluxe at the beginning. Um, when, when our office moved in, we were only four p people. We're now um, sort of knocking on... 12 people. Namaiki, the graphic designers are the same, they've got six staff. Nakamegaro Yakioku, the, the, the graphic, uh, the high-end TV graphics guy's got four people working for them. And so the whole space where we had all of our events and where all the cross crossovers happened has become an office. And uh, we can't, we can't put, put, put on events anymore. And we found this has been a sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of really sad. So we've just opened a new space called Super Deluxe. And we've taken all of the, the, um, the event sort of component out of that and put it into uh, this new space. Uh, we've worked on the graphics a little bit and made it a little bit more super. Um, and that's, that's the space. Again, this whole thing can be moved around. It can, it's basically a gallery and bar during the week, uh, but you can rent it. You can uh, have all sorts of different performances and things there. And it's using all the experiences we've had from, from Deluxe. Um, it's not about the interior, it's about content. So we don't really care about what's on the walls. It's just a very simple box. Uh, with very cheap furniture that can be moved around. Um, and that opened on the 1st of November. And we've had all sorts of different events there. Um, this is uh, an after party for Issey Miyake after one of their fashion shows. Um, again, this is the bar. You can see if you see, uh, again, that's those floor tiles, the pink snakes and floor tiles we've printed out. Our uh, deluxe pattern on those. These are the taps. Um, they're just from Science. Uh, catalogue. Um, Miss Universe Japan had a had a presentation there, which we all enjoyed. <laughs> That's been fashion shows. Um, this is Cocoon. Uh, it's quite nice. They projected all the de 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 details of the clothes on these screens before the models came out, and it all went slowly to white as the models walked up and down. Um, this is William Broeke, a very famous Dutch band who came and played very avant-garde in in improv type thing. These are our bean bags we, we made with Levi's. And, get our logo in as much as we can. Um, but this is really important to us, and uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a real pain sometimes. We, we're really busy, and we shouldn't be um, have, have, having events and things. But without them, um, the energy, I think, uh, dis, dis, dissipates from our work. So it is, it is really important. 
This is just for um, ResFest, uh, a digital art thing. Uh, again, lots of people, we're putting lots of our friends together um, to play. Uh, John's from o o and m uh, This is Exonimo. Uh, and it's quite interesting how all these musicians are working with the same computer that I'm working with, with Max. There's a very close cr crossover, a lot of the graphic guys are DJs. And um, there's, a, there's a big creative en en energy. I think that's my last slide. There we are. Um, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. So uh, Mark will take from questions. Don't go away. We just have a little bit of time. Um, maybe since there is not a lot of time, I could go straight to you guys and uh, see if there is a question from the audience. Who would like to uh, to uh, to start? It's just like Japan. Nobody asks a no, question. No, no. People do ask questions, <laughs> but there is now sort of. I have to. Yes, there is. There is somebody. Here. Can you can you wait for a second to get the microphone? How did we choose Japan? Um, Astrid and I were studying at uh, the Royal College of Art. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that in here, but um, and there was this. Um, I don't know. It's just, I'm kind of modernist at heart, and uh, all the modernists seem to go to Japan, and it was the furthest place to go. It seemed the most exotic. It was the place that everybody told us we couldn't we couldn't survive in. So it seemed enough challenge. Um, and I wanted to look at all of the traditional architecture. And it was 1998, sorry, ni ni 1988. So it was bubble time. So anything seemed to be possible in Japan. We're seeing all these crazy built buildings. And you pick, you pick up GA magazine and, or whatever, Shinkenshku. You see all these great things. And I uh, just wanted to go. You know. um, but there was this, you know, it, there was, it, it was the old and the new that we were interested in. So that's how we chose Japan. And we originally only went for three months and then ended up working with Toyota for a couple of years and then a lucky break and ended up working for ourselves. And we couldn't speak or read or write at that time. So back in 1992. We set up exactly when the bubble burst, <laughs> which was really bad timing. No, we didn't plan that. <laughs> I also sort of bought some stock. No. Um, no, it's just, it just, it just how it happened. But I think because of our sort of, um, uh, what do I want to say, scavenging, we kind of used to recessions in the UK. And the way we um, go about getting work is very un-Japanese. And uh, we don't necessarily cold call, but we'll invent projects like the UK 98 Pavilion. Pro project didn't exist, but we kind of hustle one into position. You know, and we look at, you know, we'll do a bit of advertising work or looking at those installations for Virgin or whatever. It's not just about architecture. It all informs our architecture, but it's not, it's not just pure. We don't sit there and wait for the building to come in. You know, the buildings are coming now, but, but it, this has really helped to establish us. But you didn't have that from the beginning, no? I mean, how did you, uh, at what point do you decide in terms of the crossover between, because I, I, I remember you telling me that first when you went and you started getting some work through Ito, presumably that was more conventional architectural yeah, well, projects. It was, the, but it was more furniture. The, uh, mm. In fact, our first ever client, um, I don't know if anybody's seen that book um, uh, that Blueprint put out on nine projects from Tokyo uh, that Richard Rogers, they're all Richard Rogers buildings. We met the same client, that was 1990. And that's, that allowed us to set, to set up on our own, 1991 actually. And uh, Richard Rogers was doing nine buildings in Tokyo. Zaha was doing four. Mm -hmm. Tobias Scarpa was doing one. And we'd met this guy, and we were doing a couple of buildings. Uh, two, uh, one was on site, and uh, the bubble burst. And every, everybody was called in and said, everything's stopping. And so it was, it was a huge shock. But we'd spent a year and a half working on a pr project that didn't exist in the end. And then we worked on Tokyo World Ex e Expo, again, through e e Ito. There was 15 pavilions. That was for 1996, and that got cancelled as well. So another eight, 18 months working on projects on bu buildings that nothing happened. Um, and it, was only it wasn't until 1996 when we met uh, Kurosaki from the e e e in that project to begin. In those other interim times, we were doing interiors, things like that. But we knew that you know, there was potential in Japan, and it was, it was worth s sort of holding on. And uh, 
there was something new. We saw something new every single day. We said that we'd, we'd always, if, you know, until we stopped seeing new things, we'd stay in Japan. And that's pretty much the same today. We still see new things every, every, every day. How about a question from one of the Japanese students? What do you think about this Englishman doing all this uh, strange work in, uh, in Japan? You can ask in Japanese. In Japanese, <laughs> yes. <coughs> no, I think that the, maybe while you're thinking, uh, what, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you've made your connections with the, the DJs and, you know, people from, from other fields. What about uh, sort of young Japanese practices? Because uh, the, do, you, do you feel no, you've got sure. much of an involvement with yeah, them? Totally. Or, yeah, totally. I think there's a whole new generation of, um, of architects coming out of Japan, Mi Kangumi, uh, Atelier One. Atelier um, again, it, it's funny how things happen. Um, again, when you look back in the UK, there are lots of... Uh, there are lots of uh, collaborative type efforts, FAC, things like that, mm. coming together from all different fields. And uh, the same thing's happening in Japan. It's, I think you know, it's, it's just how, I think the internet has helped that too. Um, mm. It's broken down lots of barriers. Certainly the computer's broken down a lot of barriers. Um, and again, using Macintosh, you can be graphic designer, you can be product designer, you can be all sorts of different things. Um, but yeah, we, the, um, we, we work a lot with, uh, people of our age, mm -hmm. Jap Jap Japanese designers. There's very, uh, nobody's worried about sort of backstabbing and things like that. Nobody, nobody will come and steal, steal our client. Everybody's got their own little s circle. Um, and it's all very polite um, and, and quite nice. Nobody's, um, if you go to a party, everybody turns up. Um, we're at a, uh, an awards ceremony. Like the whole of the Japanese architectural scene was there. Everybody turned up for, Has for Hasegawa's medal. A ceremony. And she said thanks to Toyoito because she really liked one of his buildings, and be without him building that building, she wouldn't have been able to do her building. And that would be sort of unheard of here. And uh, that's that's really that's how it sort of works. And is there something specific that's coming out of this younger generation? I mean, apart from their use of technology or working across different fields, what do you do? Um, I mean, in terms of difference with Hasegawa, with Ito, what, is, what do you think marks there? Again, they're less precious about the, the design, I think. Mm. Pretty much like us too, we're not, it doesn't have to be, that there isn't this style that everybody's trying to nurture. People will do different things. Um, again, within our work, we're not, we're trying to say there's a spirit, but there isn't, there isn't a style. And mm. I think that's coming through in a lot of the younger Japanese mm. designers. You, you've never seen you so quiet. <laughs> Back there, yes, please. <laughs> you've got, you've got, you've got planners here. The, qu the yeah. question was, we're having a lot of fun, fun there. We're going to come back. My answer was, there are a lot of planners here, so we're a bit afraid. Um, yeah, things, things are beginning to happen. There are, there are one or two things I can't talk about at the moment, but it looks like we'll be coming doing some stuff in Milan sh shortly. Um, we've got an exhibition coming up in Eindhoven in Holland, and maybe a project there too. Um, we have an exhibition design museum, twenty uh, fourth of January. Um, so yeah, I think we'd we'd like to come back. I mean, this is this this is home, and I haven't unpacked yet. I've been there for four, fourteen years, and I've still got stuff in boxes. So um, yeah, maybe it would, be, it would it would be nice. I mean, one of the thoughts always was that we'd come back with a portfolio of work and and tell the planners that you can do it like this, and it doesn't. You know, it isn't going to hurt the city, and uh, you know we've actually got a built port, port, port portfolio of strange stuff. Um, so, yeah, we'd like to anyway. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. A little present for. Oh, you can have the present. There okay, you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>